Hello, welcome to chapel this afternoon or this morning whenever you are joining us. We're glad that you are able to join us wherever you are and we uh, hope that you will have an enjoyable time today as we share in singing some old familiar hymns. Let's begin by praying together the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Well, let's sing Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, our sweet the sound that sing a variety of hymns today. There's no particular theme, so I don't have a whole lot to say about that. Uh, but I do want to say that it is amazing grace, and that's why we're here. And so we're going to sing that verse again. And then we will sing the last verse that says, when we've been there 10,000 years. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. on that last verse it just makes it seem all the most more joyous uh, than it did in the first time first time around our first hymn today is a great hymn of praise it's crown him with many crowns it was written by Matthew Bridges uh, he was an Anglican clergyman who when he was 48 converted to Roman Catholicism and he became a Roman Catholic priest um, he wrote originally six verses to this hymn. Most hymnals do not have, uh, they only have four in most hymnals. Uh, but some years after he wrote his particular uh, verses, Godfrey Thring, I think that's such an interesting name, T-H-R-I-N-G, that's kind of hard to say, Thring. Uh, he was an Anglican clergyman and he wrote a verse because he thought it needed to have a verse about the resurrection. And so he wrote the verse that we are familiar uh, singing, crown him the Lord of life who triumphed o'er the grave. Uh, so that's a great, great uh, verse that he wrote. And I'm so glad that that one is in our hymnals today. I don't know what was left out, but I love that particular verse. So let's sing, crown him with many crowns. <clears throat> says, crown him the, the Lord of life who triumphed o'er the grave and rose victorious in the strife for those he came to save. The third verse says, crown him the Lord of love, his hands, behold his hands and side, those wounds yet visible above in beauty glorified. And the last verse in my particular version, and it's not the same in all hymnals, is crown him the Lord of heaven, 
enthroned in worlds above. Crown him the king to whom is given the wondrous name of love. That's great, isn't it? What a great name, the wondrous name of love. Let's sing that first verse one more time. Crown him with many crowns, a lamb upon his throne. first hymn you sing on Sunday morning because it just seems like uh, that's the great hymn of praise and uh, Jim always selected a hymn of praise as the first hymn so that one was often one of the ones that we sang at the beginning and I can't think of a better way to start a worship service than to sing crown him with many crowns and then let's sing there is a fountain filled with blood this is another one that you will not find in as many hymnals today but there is a great theological truth here um, this fountain filled with blood is the way that we have received salvation. It is by, because of the death of Jesus. So there is a fountain filled with blood written by William Cowper and published in 1772. So this is another one that's very old. From Zechariah 13.1, we read these words. A fountain will be opened to the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them of their impurity. So let's sing together. There is a fountain filled with blood. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that blood lose all their guilty stains lose all for you or tell you all the details of William Cowper's life, but let me tell you this much, that he suffered terribly from depression, very, very severe, dark depression, and uh, often contemplated how he might kill himself because his depression was so severe. And uh, fortunately, as he tried numerous times, and it's very interesting to read the ways that he tried, he was kept from succeeding. And he thought, he believed very strongly that it was the hand of God that had kept him from succeeding in all of those uh, tumults and trials that he suffered. And finally, he recovered uh, from a severe bout where he had attempted suicide numerous times. He finally recovered, and it was in that recovery that he came to realize that God can erase the stain of any sin, even his sins. And of course, he felt like the suicide attempts were a real um, sin for him. So it's an interesting um, history of him uh, writing this hymn for us. The second verse says, Dear dying lamb, thy precious blood shall never lose its power. And that's what we're singing about today, that it is through his blood that we are cleansed. And then it says, sinners plunged beneath that flood lose all their guilty stains. And that was what William Cowper decided as he came out of that very, very bleak period of depression in his life. Let's sing it one more time. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins and sinners plunged beneath that flood Lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, lose all their guilty stains, and sin is plunged beneath the flood, lose all their guilty stains. Just a 
week or two we ago, we sang, What Can Wash Away My Sins? Yep. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Right, and so right. now we have sung about that fountain flowing. Our next hymn is one that is a um, southern gospel and revival and evangelistic style of song. And it's called, He Keeps Me Singing, or There's Within My Heart a Melody. And this was also written by Luther Bridges. And so we sang a song for, uh, by him just a moment ago. Uh, and he wrote this song as well. So I'll tell you a little bit more about this hymn after we sing oh, it. Uh, Linda, this is a song that I learned over the battery radio, <laughs> how to play gospel. <laughs> Oh, my. Uh, the old-fashioned uh, revival hour. Well, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about oh, that. Oh, yes, I know that. Uh, <laughs> I don't but, want to jump the gun on no, you. No, it's uh, <laughs> what he thought about his tune, his oh, melody. Okay. Yeah, it's very interesting. So let's sing it through key. one time. There's within my heart. There's, There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. and was a minister in the Methodist Episcopal Church South, uh, born in North Carolina, attended Asbury Seminary, uh, and even though he did not graduate, he became a uh, pastor. And this hymn, um, scholars agree that he experienced a very uh, significant tragedy in his life. And you know, many of our hymns came out of a tragedy that people uh, experienced. This tragedy happened to be that while he was preaching at a revival in Middlesboro, Kentucky, he had left his wife and three small sons with her parents in Harrodsburg, Kentucky. And at the conclusion of the uh, revival on March 26, 1911, he received a call that his wife Sarah and three sons, ages five, three, and seven months, five, three, and then seven months, had lost their lives in the fire. Yes. Now, you would think that this hymn came out of that. There are scholars who believe that, but most scholars today said, no, we don't believe that it did. In fact, that he had written it about 10 years earlier. And one of the reasons that they think that is because of the style of the music. It is too joyous. And the hymns that we have that were written out of great tragedies, um, It Is Well With My Soul is a great example of that, are not joyous melodies like this is. And so... Uh, most people do not think that he wrote it uh, after the death of those um, of his children and his wife. Uh, let's sing that song one more time. There's within my heart a melody. Jesus whispers sweet and low. Fear not, I am with thee. Peace be still. In all of hearts heaven. Shall We Gather at the River? And this is the one I think that I was thinking about, Bill, when you talked about the style. But it's the same sort of style that we yes. just sang. Like yes, Shall We Gather at the River. Yeah, right. This hymn was written by Robert Lowry. And uh, I'll tell you what he said about it after we sing the first verse, because he had some interesting comments to make about this hymn that he wrote. Now, he wrote both the words and the music. Yes. Shall We Gather at the River? said this about this hymn that he wrote. It is a brass band music. It has a march, 
movement and for that reason has become popular. Though for myself, I do not think much of it. <laughs> and yet he wrote it. <laughs> Um, however, he did go on to tell some interesting um, um, information about times that he had heard it sung and the impact that it made on him. So let me share those with you. Yet he tells us how on several occasions he had been deeply moved by the singing of this hymn that really he didn't think too much about. Going from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania to Lewisburg, he wrote, once I got into a train car filled with a half-drunken lumberman. Suddenly one of them struck up, Shall We Gather at the River? And they sang it over and over again, <laughs> repeating the chorus in a loud, wild, and boisterous way. I did not think so much of the music then as I listened to those singers, but I did think that perhaps the spirit of the hymn, the words so flippantly uttered, might somehow survive and be carried forward into the lives of those careless men and ultimately lift them upward to the realization of the hope expressed in my hymn. A different appreciation of it was uh, occurred when uh, Robert, it, during the Robert Rake's centennial, and I have no idea what that was, but he wrote, I was in London and had gone to a meeting in the Old Bailey to see some of the most famous Sunday school workers in the world. They were present from Europe, Asia, and America, and I sat in a rear seat alone. After there had been a number of addresses delivered in various languages, I was preparing to leave when the chairman of the meeting announced that the author of Shall We Gather at the River was present and I was requested by name to come forward. Men applauded and women waved their handkerchiefs as I went to the platform. It was a tribute to the hymn, but I felt when it was over that, after all, I had perhaps done some little good in the world, and I felt more than ever content to die when God called. Interesting, isn't it? Yeah, even though he didn't really care much for the music that he wrote. <laughs> He came to believe that the hymn might have some benefit to people, and I think that's interesting. God can use even music that we don't like, and it did for him. So let's sing it one more time. Shall we gather at the river where my nature feet have drawn with its crystal type very much a part of the revivalism and what is called Adventism in much of the post-Civil War Wesleyan preaching and uh, worship. And um, it really uh, is a, very typical of many of the hymns that many of us grew up uh, singing. Many readers have grown up singing this and other songs on a similar theme during Sunday school gatherings, wrote one of the hymnologists that I read and also at Sunday evening services and also at revivals. And some of the similar songs, according to this hymnologist, and that's somebody that writes about hymns, if we have to remember that. I had to look up the word. Um, when the roll is called up yonder, shall we gather at the river? Oh, that will be glory for me. All of those are hymns in that style. Um, these um, hymns did not uh, address anything new hymn writers have always written about heaven, including Charles Wesley. He wrote about that a lot. Uh, but the 19th century hymns had a lot of uh, kind of oomph to them. Um, let's see. The verses of this hymn um, are, like, let's sing the first verse, and then I'll talk about what the verses say, okay? Sing the wondrous love of Jesus. Sing his mercy and his grace. In the mansions bright and blessed, He'll prepare for us a place. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus, we'll sing and shout the victory. These verses are all, uh, 
it, they're all full of biblical allusions. Uh, in the first stanza, we just sang, In the mansions bright and blessed, he'll prepare for us a place. And you remember that Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? The second verse says, uh, Clouds may overshadow the skies, but when traveling days are over, not a shadow, not a sigh. And in the book of Revelation, we read that there will be, in the city, there will be no need of the sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And furthermore, the sighs of sorrow and pain are all be left behind, because, again, the writer of the Revelation says, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, for the former things are passed away. And in the third verse, it says, Just one glimpse of him in glory will the toils of life repay. In First Peter, we read, But rejoice inasmuch as you are partakers of Christ's sufferings, that when his glory will be revealed, you may be glad also with exceeding great joy. And in the fourth verse, he talks about the pearly gates and the streets of gold, images that were drawn again from the book of Revelation. And the 12 gates were 12 pearls. Every gate was of one pearl, and the street of the city was pure gold, as it were transparent glass. So many of the allusions, uh, words that he placed into his hymn are actually taken from scripture. Let's sing the first verse again and uh, think about what a grand and glorious day that will be. Sing the wondrous love of Jesus, sing his mercy and his grace. says, um, when I see him, will I fall on my knees and, and tremble? Uh, I can't, I don't think, now I can't think of all the words, but it's, will I, will I be able to speak at all? Yeah, that's, you know, and this song says, we'll sing and shout the victory. I'm sure there'll be a lot of different responses. I can, only, I can imagine. only imagine. Thank you. Yes, that's right. I can only imagine. I knew it was there, but I couldn't come with, with all the words. When they come to me in the middle of one song, it's hard to remember the words of the one I'm trying to think about. So, But it, it's interesting that one songwriter talks about singing and shouting the victory, and the other songwriter talks about how we might feel when we first see him. We can only imagine how we might feel. It's, well, it'll feel probably about like Pentecost. It might. When everybody understood what was happening, even though it wasn't in their language. It may well come that way. Yeah. Our next hymn is Love Lifted Me. What a great, great hymn. Love Lifted Me. You want to sing it? Yes. Oh, oh. Let's sing it. <laughs> Sorry. The, you thought I was going to say something first. <laughs> I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. Love the master of the sea heard my despairing cry. From the waters lifted me, now safe am I. Love lifted me, love lifted me. When nothing else could help, love lifted me. James Rowe in 1912, and the music was written by Howard Smith. Howard Smith's daughter wrote this about her father. Howard E. Smith was a little man 
whose hands were so knotted with arthritis that you could wonder how he could use them at all, much less play the piano. I can see them now, my father striding up and down, humming a bar or two, and Howard E. playing it and jotting it down. Isn't that something? The, uh, it was first published in 1912 and became very popular when it was included in the Methodist Cokesbury Hymnal, which is one that many Methodist people will remember growing up with. Of course, I did not. Uh, but they sang, used it a lot on Sunday nights uh, for Sunday night services Amen. and Wednesday night services. And they ha it has a, a lot of great old gospel hymns. Mr. Rowe, who wrote these words, uses biblical images from two different stories in this, um, in this uh, song. The first is found in Matthew 14, where the disciples were in a boat in the midst of a storm. And um, they were uh, thinking that they were going to you know, drown, and the winds were uh, up, and it was just stormy. And then they saw Jesus walking on the sea, and he told Peter, come come and join him and you remember that Peter got out of the boat and began to walk on water but the storm when he stopped looking at Jesus and started looking at the waves and listening to the roaring winds what happened he began to sink and he called out to Jesus who saved him and Jesus caught Peter by the hand and lifted him up as they then got into the boat and so love lifted me the second story is in Matthew 8, again, a storm on the Sea of Galilee in which Jesus was asleep in the boat when the storm came and the disciples were terrified that they were going to drown. And they woke Jesus up and said, Jesus, don't you care that we're going to drown? And you'll remember that Jesus spoke to the wind and the sea and it became calm. And so both of these are images that he uses in uh, this hymn. Let's uh, sing that first verse again together. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore, very deeply stained within, sinking to rise no more. But the master of the sea heard my despairing cry, from the waters lifted me, now safe. remember the song director, I'm sure I have shared this with you before, but uh, often the song, song leader or choir director uh, would say, now on the third verse, let's sing, instead of love lifted me, sing John 3.16. And so we did, and we all had to say John 3.16 together. And let's say that together. For God so, so loved, loved the world that he gave his, his only begotten God's Son, that, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, perish but have everlasting life. And so that's how he lifted us, because God gave his son. So uh, that brings back fond memories for me, singing that hymn. Our next hymn is Blessed Be the Tie That Binds, which is one of two of the most famous uh, and popularly sung closing hymns. Blessed Be the Tie and God Be With You Till We Meet Again are the two songs that are sung most often as closing hymns sometimes after what many would call the invitation hymn, the benediction and then the closing hymn might be, blessed be the tie or God be with you, which is the way we use God be with you. We have the benediction and then we sing God be with you. So that, that's pretty common. Uh, so this is a very, very popular closing hymn. It was sung in the 1940 movie, Our Town. Some of you may have seen that movie, Our Town. It was nominated for several Academy Awards. Um, this story, there is a great story about this hymn, and I will uh, briefly tell you that story, and then we'll sing, and then I want to share with you some of the other verses. Dr. John Fawcett 
was a pastor of a small church at Winsgate, Waynesgate, I guess is the way you pronounce that. Um, and he received a call to a larger church in London in 1772. And um, he accepted the call and preached his farewell sermon. The wagons were loaded with his books and his furniture and all was ready for the departure when his parishioners gathered around him and with tears in their eyes begged him to stay. His wife said, oh John, John, I cannot bear this. And he replied, neither can I and we will not go. And so they unloaded the wagons and put everything back as it was and he stayed where he was. I bet there have been some other preachers who, when they found out what church they were going to, decided they'd rather stay where they were. I'm sure that has happened more than once. Uh, but I thought that was an interesting story. And then the uh, Albert Bailey, who is another hymnologist, described this congregation at Wayne's, Waynesgate. Listen to how he described these people whom they loved so much. The people were all farmers and shepherds, poor as Job's turkey. I bet you haven't heard that saying in a long time. Poor as Job's turkey, an uncouth lot whose speech one could hardly understand, unable to read or write, most of them pagans cursed with vice and ignorance and wild tempers. The established church had never touched them, only the humble Baptist, there you go, Bill, only the humble Baptist had sent an itinerant preacher there and he had made a good beginning and those were the people that loved John and Mary Fawcett so much that they did not want them to leave. And that the Fawcett's loved so much that they decided not to leave. I think that's a wonderful story. Um, let's sing, Blessed Be the Tie That Binds. We haven't sung it yet, have we? I don't think so. Okay, first time through. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts and grips to love. says before our father's throne we pour our ardent prayers our fears our hopes our aims are one our comforts and our cares we share each other's woes our mutual burdens bear and often for each other flows the sympathizing tear and this last verse is the one that most hymnals end with but I have two more verses in mind today this is typically the last verse of this hymn when we asunder part, it gives us inward pain, but we shall still be joined in heart and hope to meet again. Isn't that great? This, uh, this uh, rendition of the hymn has two other verses, and I don't know if Mr. Fawcett wrote these words or someone else has added them, I don't know, but hear these words. This glorious hope revives our courage by the way while each in expectation lives and longs to see the day. From sorrow, toil, and pain, and sin, we shall be free, and perfect love and friendship reign through all eternity. Let's sing that again. Blessed be the time that binds our hearts in Christian love. Many of our songs today have had very significant allusions to, uh, to the scripture. That one did really not have that for us, but this one does. This one is, I am resolved. Um, it's not in very many hymnals today. I am resolved to go to the Savior. Uh, this is based on Luke chapter 15, the story that we know as the story of the prodigal son. And you'll remember that he had spent all of his uh, uh, inheritance that his father had given him in wild living, and he had run out of money. And when he ran out of money, he ran out of friends. And he was, this little Jewish boy was feeding the pigs. Can you imagine how awful that was for a young Jewish boy to be taking care of pigs? And then the Bible says, I will arise and go to my father, and I will say unto him, 
Father, I have sinned against heaven and against thee, and I am no more worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. You remember what the rest of the story said? That while he was coming, his father saw him and ran to greet him, ran to meet him and threw his arms around him. What a wonderful picture of the love of God as he goes to meet us and draws us to himself. Um, in 1906, let's see, who wrote this? Palmer, Palmer Hartsoff wrote this. And in 1906, at the age of 62, he became an ordained Baptist minister and moved to Ontario, Michigan, and pastored a church there for 21 years and then retired and returned to Plymouth, Michigan, where he died in 1932 at the age of 88. Good story and a great old song. Uh, some of you may not know this one, but I hope that you'll like it uh, because it does have some great words to it. I am resolved. that the Apostle Paul wrote. If there's anything good or lovely or beautiful or worthy and all of those things, think on these things. And um, so that's what this song alludes to in that verse. The second verse says, the first verse says, I am resolved no longer to linger. The second verse says, I am resolved to go to the Savior, leaving my sin and strife. The third verse says, I am resolved to follow the Savior, faithful and true, each day. And the fourth verse says, I am resolved to enter the kingdom, leaving the paths of sin. And then the last verse says, I am resolved, and who will go with me? Come, friends, without delay, taught by the Bible, led by the Spirit, will walk the heavenly way. Aren't those wonderful words? I love this hymn. Let's sing it one more time. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delights. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my soul. sing that. Yeah. That's just great. <laughs> Isn't that great? I always, always remember the basses really singing. Yes, we need some basses to sing out on that one. Well, our last hymn today is, uh, and this is a, an appropriate last hymn. It's sort of a hymn of consecration for us as we end, and it is, Take My Life and Let It Be Consecrated, Lord, to Thee. It was written by Francis Havergal uh, in 1874. And this is based on the um, words of Paul in Romans chapter 12. I, er I urge you, therefore, brethren, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your spiritual act of worship. That's a newer translation than many of us remember, but I think it says the same thing for us. Let's um, sing the first verse, and then I will uh, read just a little bit about uh, what was written about this hymn. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let them flow. Let's pray. 
Frances Havergal wrote this, I went for a little visit of five days to Airely House. I don't know what that is, but that's where she went. And there were 10 persons in the house, some unconverted and long prayed for, some converted but not rejoicing Christians. He gave me the prayer, Lord. He gave me all this house, and he just did. Before I left the house, everyone had got a blessing. The last night of my visit after I had retired, the governess asked me to go to the two daughters. They were crying, and then and there, both of them trusted and rejoiced. It was nearly midnight. I was too happy to sleep and passed most of the night in praise and renewal of my own consecration. And these little couplets formed themselves and chimed in my heart one after another till they finished with ever only all for thee. So let me share with you, this is a prayer, and let me share with you these words. Take my hands, Lord, and let them move at the impulse of thy love. Take my feet and let them be swift and beautiful for thee. Take my voice and let me sing always only for my king. Take my lips and let them be filled with messages from me, from thee. Take my silver and my gold, not a mite would I withhold. Take my intellect and use every power as thou shalt choose. Take my will and make it thine, it shall be no longer mine. Take my heart, it is thine own, it shall be thy royal throne. Take my love, my Lord, I pour at thy feet its treasure store. Take myself, and I will be ever only all for thee. What a wonderful prayer. Let's sing that one more time. Make this your prayer today. Take my life and let it be consecrated, Lord, to Thee. Take my moments and my days, let them flow in ceaseless praise. Let them flow in ceaseless praise. It's a wonderful prayer, isn't it? That might be a good way to begin our day every day. I'm just thinking for me, it might be a good way. Well, we have come to the end of our time all too quickly, and it is time for us to share together in reading or reciting the 23rd Psalm. So those of you who are here in the chapel will find that in your binder. And let's read or recite together. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Hear these words from the uh, writer of the book of Jude, the letter of Jude, uh, who is, whose name is also Judah, which is the uh, Hebrew rendering of the Greek Jude, and who was believed to be the brother of Jesus to the one who is able to protect you from falling and to present you blameless and rejoicing before his glorious presence, to the only God our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, belong glory and majesty, power and authority before all time, now and forevermore. Amen. Let's sing together, God be with you till we meet again. God be with you till we meet again. Life's counsels guide upon you. With the sheep securely fold you. God be with you till we meet again. Till we meet.
and may God be with you till we meet again next week.